Swedish American of the Year, Nils Lofgren. Valsorden av Amerika utsåg musikern Nils Lofgren till årets svenska amerikan 2016. Han är den 57 i ordningen som tar emot denna hedersutmärkelse. Lofgren har sina svenska rötter i Värmland och är en av världens främsta rockmusiker. He has some magnificent music out there and his own solo tours and his own solo presence inspired me before we made Born to Run. Nils and I came out around the same time and I used to listen to Nils records to see what I wanted my records to sound like. So he's uh, he's a wonderful musician. Nils is one of those musicians who simply is music. It just it's in his veins, it's in his bones, it courses through his body. It doesn't get any better. Årets svenska amerikan är en utnämning som uh, görs eller ges till en svensk ättling som har gjort något framträdande i USA och på det viset så hedrar den personen sitt hemland. Men det är också en historisk bit där, som går tillbaka på emigrationen från Sverige till USA där väldigt många svenskar lämnade Sverige och nu kan vi på det viset se tillbaka Samtidigt som vi tar fram en person som idag är verksam i USA och hedrar Sverige på det viset. Ja, ordet svenska amerikan det är ju en eh, verksamhet som har pågått sedan 1960. Och eh, den som eh, eh, faktiskt var mannen bakom som kom med idén var Alvin Widén, författare och eh, mycket stora amerikavän. Han ville att man skulle uppmärksamma någon svensk amerikan som gjort sig känd och åstadkommande och mycket inom sin bransch. Det behöver alltså inte betyda att man har gjort mycket för Sverige och Amerika, men att man har utmärkt sig inom sin verksamhet. Ja, Nils Lofgren, han har varit, dels har han ju en otrolig karriär bakom sig som musiker. Och eh, oerhört skicklig sådan, multiinstrumentalist och, och spelar tillsammans med Bro Springsteen i 32 år. Och eh, sen har han ju också den här passionen för Sverige. Han eh, har hållit eh, vid liv kontakterna med sin värmländska släkt på ett alldeles fantastiskt sätt. Det såg vi ju nu när han hyllade som årets svenska amerikan hur hans värmländska släkt ställde upp. Och eh, jag förstod också eh, genom samtal med honom hur viktigt det var att hans släktingar från Värmland var med när han hyllades just som årets svenska amerikan. I was lucky to get to know my dad's parents uh, from Sweden. They were, you know, People I saw regularly, I got to know them pretty well, especially my grandmother and my grandfather. Uh, they settled in Astoria, Oregon on the Columbia River. That's where my grandfather and I think, if I remember, 20 or 30 men scoured the U.S. for almost three years before they sent for the women and children. Uh, when they finally made a home, they built a lot of the town of Astoria, Oregon on the Columbia River. They sent for my grandmother My father at the time was three years old. So they settled in Astoria and, um, you know, of course, my dad was a pilot in World War II, met my mom there, who was the uh, daughter of uh, Sicilian immigrants from Nicosia, Sicily. And um, after the war, they got married, dated. I was born in Chicago. But at a young age, uh, also, I think I was five years old, I asked for accordion lessons and, um, Right away, I started learning the old country songs for both cultures, Sweden and Italy. And uh, my grandmother, they, they traveled, they came to visit us. We went to Astoria, so I got to know them pretty well. I still remember my, uh, uh, my Swedish grandfather taking me down to the Columbia River, which was just a, a good walk down the hill from the house that he built. 
and he tried to teach me to whittle. Have these beautiful whittling knives. Uh, he was a carpenter, and you know he'd sit there and whittle me a little toy. And uh, I have, uh, you know, he passed away in his 80s, but I have a knife, one of the whittling knives that my parents gave me that belonged to my grandfather, which is a great, great thing to have in memory. And my grandmother had a really heavy Swedish accent, but they became citizens and might raise my dad and, and his sister and brother as citizens. And um, so it was kind of charming uh, to go visit them because they, it's so, so extraordinary to imagine somebody leaving their home, you know, go to a country where, like when my grandmother came, she didn't speak a word of English. She knew she had to go from New York City where the boat docked and get on a train and find Astoria, Oregon, 3,000 miles away. And they got lost. They couldn't communicate. I mean, that it took weeks. And they finally found their new home in Astoria. But they're, they're really great people, had a great sense of humor. And I, I still remember, um, and my dad, Swedish pancakes, great dish. My, my grandmother, incredible cook, made all the old you know, Swedish meatballs, pancakes, all the old dishes incredible breads, you know, sweet breads, rye breads, wheat breads, multi, all different kinds of great bread. And it was funny because when I used to go visit her, um, she was always feeding me like, you know, you got to eat more, you got to eat more. And I, she said, Grandma, you've been cooking for men that have been cutting trees down 12 hours a day. I'm not cutting trees down. I'm just sitting here visiting with you. I don't need to eat five meals a day. But, you know, it was too classic grandmother who just felt better if you were eating, so I did. And um, my dad cooked great Swedish pancakes and omelets for us, and he picked some of that up. But there was always seemed just kind of a healthy matter of fact acknowledgement of the heritage. But, you know, as Americans, you know, we didn't pretend it, where we, we weren't from Sweden and Italy. And we kind of embraced it, but we didn't belabor it either. It was just an, a healthy part of our lives. And uh, always loved being around my grandparents. Uh, I remember I was in Astoria. My whole family was visiting there with my brothers. I'm the oldest of four boys. And uh, we're just having a great time. My grandmother also had an old zither, an old Swedish zither that she used to play. I, I messed around with it a bit, but it was you know hard to tune and very ancient. It's kind of a beautiful, cool thing that she had. And um, it was really healthy for me to get to spend a good amount of time, you know, with my dad's parents um, and just talk to them and, and just the fact that their journey was being in a country they loved, Sweden, and it was so impossible to feed their families up in Varmland, whatever was going on, that they actually made a commitment to move to America. And we all go back to Sweden. Of course, I go with the E Street Band and with my own bands. I've been there to play and done acoustic shows there. My brothers have taken trips there on vacation. I've gone there a couple of times. One of Amy, my wife and I, it's one of our favorite places to be. Uh, just past my heritage connection too. People are friendly. Uh, the practical matter is they speak English if you're in trouble. So, uh, but it was a blessing to, to spend a lot of time around my grandparents and, and kind of soak in the, the history from their point of view. I hit the road when I was 18 and in my 20s I started touring Europe quite a bit. And just the practicality of um, the people are warm and friendly, they speak English. And I remember even back then when I was very young and uh, kind of suspicious of governments, we had a lot of problems in America with the Vietnam War, Kennedy assassination, Cuban Missile Crisis. There was a lot of rough stuff going on, much like today, right? Politics are a mess. And, um, and then you go to Sweden and you get a sense, well, in, in this country, look, every country has problems. But there was a sense that everyone's kind of in a practical, common sense way, getting along. And the disagreements are more cordial and productive towards a solution. Having been there a lot with the E Street Band, and I think probably 
Sweden might be our most popular country. Um, and we we're popular, much more popular in Europe in general than America, which is just the way it is, which is fine. But I think of all the countries in, in Europe, Sweden might be our most, you know, beloved country as far as the band being welcome there, uh, the excitement about the band. And also, too, it doesn't hurt that my dad's from Sweden and my name. And when I go there, even on my acoustic shows, there is a, a different connection there that, um, of course, it's natural, you know, like to have your roots there. It means something to me, it means something to the audience. Now, if you get up and sing awful, then they're not going to come back, whether you're, whether you're Swedish or not. But if you do a good job and you take it seriously, which I've always done, there's an added familiarity and I think uh, something good that comes from, from having some Swedish heritage. I'm back when I first started going to Sweden in the 70s, I had a rock band. It wasn't the acoustic show. And I think I uh, might have played the melody in Stockholm. But, you know, we played... These, back in the 70s, these, these, this was when you would go to Europe for six or seven weeks. You'd go for a long time. So we might have done six or seven shows and been in Sweden for a week and a half. Sometimes and played all over little towns, of course, Stockholm, Gothenburg, Lund. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I always just remember, and, and it, it's interesting because um, the audiences are so passionate and, and they also listen very intently. It's kind of a healthy combination of really paying attention to what you're doing, but putting themselves inside the music and not just observing like you're a specimen, kind of losing themselves in the music. So anyway, when we started experiencing these massive audiences in Sweden, especially with the E Street Band, and even well before that I'd been going regularly to play on my own, it didn't surprise me as much that the audience was very passionate and very into the music and kind of threw themselves into it and let go, because that's kind of more of what my dad was, you know? Uh, the, the stereotypical Swedish thing really didn't apply to my father, and uh, of course to me it doesn't apply to the audiences at all. But you know, there is some of that stereotype of the stoic Swedish man who just kind of is contained and quiet, which, which is fine, but it's more of a stereotype than a reality, I think. It was either magic or working on a dream. And uh, we, had start, we were starting, I think, in Sweden, in Europe, and I, I've been playing old country Swedish songs for a long time and I said, Bruce, you know, I can, if you want. So anyway, because we walked on stage in the broad daylight and, you know, it took a while. And Clarence, you know, God bless Clarence, you know, it took him a while to get up there and everyone get, so Bruce decided, why don't you go out and play a folk song? And I went out and played Ida's Summer Visa, which I've been playing since I was six or seven. So all the uh, old country Swedish songs that I play probably seven or eight of them, nine or 10 through the years, because my grandmother or grandfather like, hey, do you know this one? I just look it up, you know, get the sheet music. And uh, the melodies, the rhythms, it all felt very natural to me. And I was honored to be able to play it. And also, especially to go up on stage and play it in, you know, Stockholm or, or Gothenburg on an accordion was, you know, a beautiful thing. And of course, even better, people sang. You know, I live in Arizona now and not Chicago or Washington, D.C. So many people move out here every year because they, you know, the four month winters, whether it's the Midwest or the East Coast, Chicago, New York, D.C., four months of snow and ice is too much. Or the hurricanes or the tornadoes or the floods or the earthquakes. I lived in L.A. for decades and I was in many an earthquake. And after a while, people go, you know, let's go to Arizona. So. Well, I actually, that was just a, a happy accident. In uh, 19, I don't know, 80, 81, I was playing the Stone Pony, famous nightclub in Asbury Park, New Jersey. And um, at the end of a show I'd done there, I met Amy Aiello, my wife. 
and uh, loved her. And she didn't come there to see me, but she she came to the club with some her, her sister and her friend. And uh, her friend was uh, hanging out with my road manager who put them on the tour bus. And I got on the bus and met Amy and I convinced her to hang out with me all night. And I loved her. And 6 a.m. the bus went to Boston and I begged her to come to Boston just to keep talking. I said, look, when we get to Boston, I'll put you on a plane, a train, whatever. But she had a job and a mother and, you know, I was drinking a little bit. And I said, I'll call them and make it all, I'll square it. She said, no. And so I was in Jersey every few months and I thought I'd see her soon. Yeah, that's her right there and there. And there, that's her as a very young kid. That's probably her about when I met her, 18 or 19, maybe a couple years after that. So anyway, I thought I'd see her next time I was in New Jersey, and I didn't see her for 15 years. Uh, and then 21 years ago, I was playing here in Phoenix at a great rock club called The Rockin' Horse, which burned to the ground a few months after I played it, nothing to do with me. And she walked up at the end of my show. I had an electric band. She said, hi, remember me? And I did. In fact, I remembered the night very vividly, more than she did. So we got a second chance, but it was 15 years between the first and second date. Which, you know, I wish she'd come to Boston. She probably could have saved me a lot of ag aggravation. But uh, thank God we got a second chance and we've been together ever since. In fact, tomorrow we're celebrating our 19th wedding anniversary. And just a couple months ago in February, we celebrated our 21 years together. So kind of celebrate both anniversaries. She was there. She left West Orange, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And uh, of all things, as a teenager, she started working for Winterland Productions selling T-shirts. And this was way back in the days where there were no computers. It was rider trucks, big boxes of cash. And she, did, uh, she was working with Toto the Doobie Brothers, the Beach Boys, the Go-Go's, Andy Williams, the Tubes. So she did that for a number of years as a merch girl. And then she started getting, she loved cooking and she became a great cook. Then she started cooking in Boulder, Colorado, Georgetown, Colorado. She came through Phoenix and just loved the climate. Like so many, that's why it's grown so much. Back when she came here over 30 years ago, there were no freeways. And, you know, Scottsdale, Tempe, they were kind of a distance apart and there was like barren land. Now it's just one giant city because every year you have thousands of people that give up on the winters or the natural disasters and want to go somewhere more mild, which this place is a beautiful place to live. So I've been here 21 years and Amy a lot longer, but of course she still has her Jersey roots and I'm an honorary New Jersey because I've been up and down that turnpike playing gigs, I'm sure more than anyone who ever lived in New Jersey. I got mic cables here, all nice and wrapped up now. Got an assortment of mics, not too many. These are guitar chords, little D, very primitive, little dehumidifier I have to fill, fill up. Of course, here you have some crazy clothes from my, uh, <laughs> from my career. This, when I was like about 16, I got my mother to make me this is like, what, 65, 66, make a Nehru jacket out of drapes, drapes. And then uh, weird bell bottoms. I had her make these loops at the bottom, some horrendous fashion statement. Thank God I didn't think that that was my job. And here's a, you know, just a lot of cool stuff. This is a beautiful one that on uh, the Amnesty International tour in 88 with Peter Gabriel and Sting, Tracy Chapman and Yusu Nador. They were the headline acts, and I got to spend six weeks on the road. And Yusu, who sang on In Your Eyes with Peter Gabriel, he had these beautiful colored jackets, and I was always like, oh, man, that jacket's so great. Oh, man, I love your jacket. Well, about four or five weeks into the tour, he gave me his jacket from Yusu Nador, one of my treasured gifts here that I, you know, I didn't realize I was making such a pest of myself telling him about his jacket, but that's, you know was a great thing. And I uh, got some drums in the corner in the room for a drummer to come. Here's a great, you know, selection of guitars, acoustic, electric, that, you know, I may just grab from and, you know, whatever ideas I come up with, I've got a great collection, thankfully, over the years. Uh, this is a great, um, I don't know if you remember Hunter Thompson, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Did you ever read that book? 
Anyway, he's a gonzo journalism. He's a famous writer. Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Johnny Depp played him in the movie. Uh, and his illustrator, Ralph Stedman, is a famous illustrator. And he does this crazy artwork. And this is a, a guitar. Ralph painted three of them for my wife, Amy, for charity. Two of them have gone, and Ralph doesn't do original art, so this is very beautiful, unique. Some people will know Ralph Stedman. It's just very crazy, beautiful art that he does. This is the last one Amy's hanging on to for a... And there's Hunter Thompson. He was famous for having a cigarette holder. He was a very wild, wild writer. You'd love the book Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. This is a good introduction to Hunter Thompson. Anyway, Ralph Stedman was his illustrator, and he painted three of these for my wife Amy for charity. And this is the last one. So she's hanging out for a big bid. And Johnny Depp, Bill Murray, any of you guys? You play, you play Hunter if you want to. Give us a call. It's all for charity. <laughs> and, you know, we've got some great guitars back here. That's a beautiful one. Ralph's a good friend. He lives in Maidstone, Kent, England, of all places. Well, you know, if somebody said, hey, you got to go out and play for people right now, what do you want? It's funny, me and Amy were talking about Pearl Jam. And just a few years ago, they played in Phoenix. And um, it was a beautiful three-hour show. And we were right by the side of the stage. And... Uh, all of a sudden, the manager came and said, hey, you want to run up and play? I'm like, now? He said, now. And Eddie wants you to come play Rockin' in the Free World. I'm like, uh, all right, well, is there a tech I can talk to? And, you know, very fast. So I run up, and in the heat of the moment, I said, you have a Strat? Yeah, yeah, I got a spare Strat. Okay, got any amp with, like, an overdrive and a clean setting? Yeah, that pedal out there. And, you know, within 20 seconds, I walked out with a Strat, Fender Strat. That's my favorite. Uh, but I, I like got a lot of different great ones. Probably my most um, treasured possession, way back um, when I was 18 years old. Uh, God bless Neil Young. He had me play on the After the Gold Rush album, and I mostly played piano. But I sang a lot, and I played acoustic guitar. And when it came time to do uh, Tell Me Why, to get your acoustic, and I was like, I don't have an acoustic. And he's like, well, look, borrow mine. And we did Tell Me Why, and there was another song I played, acoustic guitar. Of course, you see the old stencil, Neil Young. This is a beautiful old funky D18 that Neil was writing on in the 60s. It's beat up as hell, but you can still see the stencil. And um, then old Martin. And at the end of this, I use this for Tell Me Why and uh, Till the Morning Comes. At the end of the end of the album, he said, "Here, I want you to keep this for doing a good job." So he gave me his guitar, which is, you know, probably my most treasured guitar. It's out of tune. Probably my most treasured guitar, and it doesn't go anywhere. I use it for recording, of course, and stays in here in the guitar closet. But, you know, to get a gift like that for working on an album like that at 18 was a, a great, great blessing. Probably leave this alone until it disintegrates and falls apart. I also, I did an album called Nil Sings Neil, The Loner, where I did uh, Neil Young songs, and um, all live in that room there. There's 50 guitars on a ship 
that just arrived in New Jersey that have been traveling the last couple of weeks from Australia that aren't here. And I've got to find a room for them. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I've co I'm working on 49 years on the road and I'm, I've accidentally accumulated a lot of stuff. So uh, it's a blessing. And, you know, some of it now I'm, I'm getting rid of just to let people use it. Well, I, you know, some of them were gifts, you know. It's, it's funny, um, I got, I have three great Martins. That one was a gift from Neil Young. And I have a D35 that's uh, in the house. That was a gift from James Kahn, the actor, Jimmy Kahn. Gave me that guitar. Just, the, and then there's another great kind of a classical steel string Martin that uh, when I was palling around with uh, Kevin McHale and the Boston Celtics, great basketball team. This is way back in the 80s. Um, they went to a big party. They were playing the Los Angeles Lakers and, and Mookie, a friend of Bill Walton's, a great basketball player, um, beautiful uh, Mexican family and the mom cooked for everyone. And um, he was like, hey, does anybody play guitar? So I got to play guitar. So he gave me this beautiful Martin and I started singing, you know, rock songs for everyone by the fireplace. And it was a beautiful party, delicious food. And uh, at the end of the night, Mookie and his mother said, hey, our, our, you know, her husband passed away a few couple years prior, and that was his guitar. And they said, look, if you, if, will you take this guitar and play it? And I'm like, I don't want to take your father's guitar. He said, well, look, he played it all the time for us, and now it just sits here. So we really would like you to take it and use it. So I've got three beautiful Martins, and they're all gifts, you know. And a lot of guitars I bought when I was a kid were back in the late 60s and 70s, you go to a pawn shop and you find a really nice guitar, but it's like $800. Now it's $18,000 or 8,000, you know. I, I just don't buy a lot of guitars anymore. There's another great one, what would it be? Let's see if I can find you. What is that? This is Takamini's. Well, it's got to be here somewhere. Black Penguin. Where is... Oh, wait. Here we go. All right. So, um... Way back, I was working with David Briggs in a Wally Hyder studio in San Francisco, probably 1970 or something, 69 or 70. We go into Berkeley to this pawn guitar shop, and I find this beautiful old 1952 Les Paul. And it's just, I mean, God knows how much this would be today. I, I don't even, I, again, I'm not an aficionado of that, but it's this gorgeous old, called Gold Top Les Paul, Les Paul, 1952. And I was doing, uh, years later, I did the trans tour at Neil Young. We did the album and tour. And, you know, Neil, Neil's old black, his famous old black guitar, is a Les Paul, and it has three pickups, and it has a Bixby. So Neil asked me to put this Bixby on, this Wang bar. It's out of tune. We put this on to kind of ghost his parts on the trans tour. And, um, you know, another great old guitar, Les Paul from 1952, that now is, you know, probably fairly valuable, but this is one I intend to hang on to. Ah, oh, heavy too. Got a little nervous there. I'm glad I found it. Well, I mean, it's just... You lose track of things because over, you know, 50 years plus, you accumulate things. And... Well, you don't play on them every day, do you? 
No, but you know, you get get an idea, and if they're not there, they're not there. And after all the years I've been doing this, I, I was lucky to grow up in the '60s with all the Beatles, Stones, British Invasion, Motown, Stax, Folk, the old blues guys. So you just there's so much information and inspiration that if you hear a sound, you know you want to kind of be able to access it. So thus the accidental collection that I've. So put. how does it feel to to be have been able to to uh, play with some of your big favorites from when you were young? It's you know it's it's kind of a surreal gift. I mean, I was just a kid. Uh, I hit the road when I was 17. In the mid '60s, well '68, and I didn't know what I was doing, so I snuck backstage and asked for advice. And um, at the cellar door in Washington D.C., Neil Young let me hang out with him. He gave me some advice. He asked me to play some songs. He liked them, and my band Grin was going to Los Angeles from uh, in about three weeks' time. We were going to L.A. to look for a record deal and move out there. And he said, "You know, I live there. Look me up when you get there." And I looked him up. And it's a long story, but true to his word, he kind of took us under his wing. And David Briggs, his producer, you know, really day to day helped us out and eventually got a record deal. David produced us and um, Neil helped us all along the way, sang on our first record, jammed with us at the bars we played in. And it started a great friendship. And then um, a couple years later, when I was 18, I did the After the Gold Rush album, so, well, just a year later, and uh, wound up getting that guitar and... You know, my band was still going in the ups and downs of the music business, but to get to make a record like that with Neil at a young age was an extraordinary experience. And of course, I've been blessed. You know, Bruce and I were distant friends for many years. We did an audition night together in 1970 at Bill Graham's Fillmore West. He had a band called Steel Mill, and I was in Grin, looking for an opening act slot from Bill Graham. And you know, so I got to know Bruce at a young age and followed him around. Was always an admirer of him and his band. Bought tickets to see him play through the 70s, um, and then when he needed a guitar player, you know, I got got a chance to try out, and it worked out. And uh, it was really on the Born USA tour I met Ringo in London because Max did a book on drummers, and I got to know Ringo, and that led to in 1989 and 92 being in the Ringo Star All Star bands. So I've been very lucky and blessed. I mean, the Beatles really were why how I fell in love with rock and roll, so the Beatles and the Stones. Um, classical music on the accordion, I didn't really understand rock and roll, of course I was 10 or 11. And then a combination of the Beatles at 12 or 13 and the extra harmonies, the extra chords, the more sophisticated uh, musical structure around this incredibly passionate, guttural, you know, rock feeling that they had in soul. And it exploded, you know, I understood all of it, I discovered through the Beatles and Stones, Stax, Volt, Motown, Little Richard, Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, all of it, through them. So, you know, to get to work with some of these people, it was just a dream come true. And, you know, it's still happening. I just got to do... Well, I never feel like one of them, but, but I feel like a peer in the sense that, hey, you know, I, I love to play live, I'm good at it. I'll, I'll walk on stage anywhere with anybody if it's... You know, jazz I love, but I don't know how to play jazz. I, I was fascinated by it. Um, it's funny, on the Amnesty International tour, Branford Marcellus and I became good friends and played basketball all over the world. But he gave me an introduction to jazz, and he actually had me play on his Buckshot LeFunk record, play on a track that Maya Angelou, our famous American poet, uh, recited poetry over this groove that Branford had, and I got to play a little bit. But um, I've been blessed, you know, to work with a lot of great musicians and learn from every one of them. And I'm still learning. It's like, it's, it's true, the more you learn, the less you know. But now for me, it's not a race, it's just kind of a journey that I'm on. And I'll be on until the day I die, whenever that is. I hope it's a long way away. But uh, yeah, I'm very lucky to come up in the 60s and get to work with people like that. And not just the famous ones. There's been many, many great players in my own bands. Of course, Ringo's bands and Bruce's bands and Neil's bands and Patty Scalf has had a couple great bands I've gone on tour with. And
they were doing the the accordion thing uh, when I did after the Gold Rush, and, and Neil and David, Neil Young and David Briggs said, "We want you to play some piano." I was like, "Well, I'm not a professional piano player." And they're like, "Yeah, but you are a classical accordionist, and you won contests and all that." And I said, "Yeah." And they said, we, we just need some simple parts, and we think you, you'll be able to handle it. So at that point, I realized I should just be quiet and say thank you and do my best. And I practiced all the time because I was nervous, because I would never played professionally piano. So um, we recorded after the gold rush at Neil Young's home up in the Topanga Hills. And on every lunch break, they'd go up to a beautiful patio up top, open air, and have lunch. And I'd stay in the little studio underneath and practice. And this one day, Ralphie Molina, the drummer, stayed behind. And we were working on Southern Man, which at the time was a half beat, like boom, boom, whack, boom, boom, real half, half time thing. <laughs> of a dirge down groove and we jammed for about a half an hour and then you know I got I got the idea because remember now I come from the accordion right and it's the whole polka thing like uh, oh, I was a barrel, we have a barrel. the whole oompa thing like uh, I don't wanna you can have her she's too fat for me she's too fat for me that's a terrible song Shame on that guy. Um, but that umpa umpa thing was so embedded in me that I took the, in the key we were in, which is D, I took, started doing octaves, and Ralphie double timed the beat. And then I came, we started jamming with this riff that was. Neil and David came back from lunch with the rest of the band, and they're like, what's that? And I said, that's Southern Man with a polka beat. You know, we double-timed the beat. And they loved it, and they said, well, when we get to the solo and then the end of the song, let's kick into that. So next time you hear Southern Man, you'll notice that the whole song is halftime. And then when we get to the solo, and then at the end, we just totally shift gears into the double-time. Ralphie double times the backbeat, and Neil plays this hellacious solo on Old Black in the middle and then at the end. So it was kind of neat that through my, you know, accordion days led to an arrangement change on such a great song in this record, you know. And it's, of course, accordion, back then, accordion was considered kind of a square instrument, but uh, now, you know, with Zydeco and all that, people have a little more of a healthy, but it's still, people poke fun at it, but it served me well. and. That's a great story how it led to a cool arrangement change on a great record like that. So. Yeah, I grew up to be someone that fell in love with performing and it just happened to give me a very spiritual hit and some healing went on for me too. And I fell in love with it. And it's something that uh, now 49 years in, I realize, and, and honestly I will say, when I go and play like my own shows, it might be 300 people in a nightclub, might be 800 people in a theater, smaller venues. But there's something about that that's great because the, the faces are right there. They're on top of you. And it actually makes it easier to get down in the music because that's really the job is you want to put a show together that you can get lost in yourself and get inspired in yourself and almost get out of your own way and become kind of the spiritual musical being and tap into a gift that's really not of your own making. And even though you get good at doing that, it's kind of magical, you know? And then of course, the biggest part of the magic is the audience. People that, I remember people, well, don't you get tired of playing Badlands with Bruce Springsteen every night? Because you play it the same. I said, no I don't, I play it different every night. Oh no you don't, yeah I do. If you notated, I'm always playing different rhythms, different inversions, still sounds like Badlands, but I don't ever play it the same. No, I never get tired of it because every night you realize that audience, whether it's 400 people in a nightclub listening to my songs, that might be the only time they ever hear that song live. So the audience makes each song new. And 
I actually find, believe it or not, in the stadiums, which are such a spectacle, and the first row is sometimes 50 feet away. It's, it's a distance, there's a distance. But the energy, and a lot of times you can get distracted at the spectacle of it. So I've long ago um, learned, especially in the stadiums, I'll go out and sometimes for a half hour, an hour, I won't even look at the audience. I mean, I hear them, I feel them, I'll just watch the band, and you know, just e even in nightclubs, but especially in the stadium, I need to do that because you can get distracted by the spectacle of it. There's this gladiator-esque type of atmosphere, and the energy is so off the charts, you know, that people are throwing at you. So I'll focus in this particular case on Bruce and the E Street Band, and I'll do that for a half hour, 45 minutes before I'll even bother to look out at the audience at all because I don't need to see them. I feel them. The energy is there. The the joy is there, the, the magic is there. And that helps me get down in the music because my job is to stay in the music. Sometimes you have an audience um, in, in a different country that's a little more sedate and they're just really listening intensely. They're not like going crazy. And that doesn't mean they're not enjoying it as much. And your job is to get down in the music and kind of get out of your own way and become the spiritual musical being to share as best you can and interact with your bandmates and create something unique that night because every night's different and in my own shows too i don't play the songs the same way i just react to the energy i'm feeling and also live i love because if you get an idea you do it in the studio you're a little safer and if there's a mistake you stop but live you never stop and, it, and the audience keeps you in the moment. And to me, it's a very unique, magical place that only exists because of the audience. And you know, I joke to people like, you know, not once in 50 years have I plugged in at home and stood there and gone crazy for four hours playing songs like that. I can't do it. There's an energy that I get from an audience that for me, only speaking for myself, does not exist in the recording studio or in my home. Now I play, I make records, I love working with musicians, but there's an energy from the audience that does not exist outside of the, the live show arena. And it's very healing and powerful for me. So that's kind of the trade-off of leaving home is you get to get that hit. And I think it, you know, for people like us that love to perform, it, it makes the price of leaving home well worth it because of what you get back from the audience performing songs that really are powerful for them and they take on a more, a more powerful meaning than if you ever played them alone at home, which I might do, but it's a completely different animal when you add the audience. Baby, you're the only one I know Baby, you're the only one I know Life's the only mother I know Wild, beautiful lyric I wrote with Lou Reed. God rest his soul. Thanks, Lou. Just recently we did this run in Australia for six weeks and I was very homesick and that's been a normal thing. Now, I don't like leaving a wonderful home anymore, but arguably, as Amy calls it, a champagne problem. It's a very high quality problem to have a home and a family that you love that loves you. So leaving it is no fun anymore because this is my 49th year on the road. And believe it or not, you know, you, like I say, you got a surprising amount of color out here in the desert. Hey guys, come here. Come here guys. Peter, I got my friend Tommy here. Come on. Peter, it's Tommy. It's okay. Two, these are our two barkers. That's Dale. Hi Dale. And there, there's Bella Blue. And this is Groucho. Grouch, hi buddy. We Groucho went blind a couple years ago, but he's doing great. And this is Rain, our pack leader. Uh, when you're a kid, like at 17, I hit the road. Every motel room door is exciting. Every airport terminal is exciting. Every dirty bar and funky theater is exciting. And I did that for thousands and thousands of times. Now what's exciting is not leaving home. That, that's a, a hardship. 
but it makes me more grateful and focused on what a rare gift it is to be able to sing and play for people. Yeah. And then you add a, you're in a band like the E Street Band with an audience like three shows in Gothenburg. We had to go back to Gothenburg to do a third show in a stadium because of ticket demand. So it just uh, really, when I wake up on a show day, I'm so more excited really than ever. And you know, of course now I'm 65, I've got two metal hips, my shoulders are torn, blah, blah, blah. You know, wear and tear, you're like, okay, go to the gym, get something good to eat, got a little more rest, da da da, da. go over to the show early. I always go over two hours early ahead of the band to do my own little prep and work with my foot pedals or guitars or my tech and get excited and prepared for this great opportunity to go out and sing and play for people, which I think because of the homesickness becomes an even more valuable opportunity and gift that I've been pursuing, you know, almost half a century professionally. And I started at six, just barely six years old with the study of music through the accordion. So it truly is my sacred weapon and to get to travel the world and, uh, you know, speaking of my Swedish roots, that's one place where Amy always tries to get to because she feels so at home there and so comfortable there. And the last couple of times we've been there. She's come over to be with me and just walk the streets and bump into people and talk to them, get to know them. And, and we, well, the, the, the award from Vasa as the Swedish American of the Year, as you mentioned, has a bit of history to it. And probably about five years ago, I remember getting a message from the ambassador in the United States, from the Swedish embassy, through a management or whatever. And I called and he said, yeah, you know, the organization in Sweden has this Swedish American of the year and they want to give the award to you. So while I was trying to reach, um, I don't know if it was Catherine, it might have been, or somebody uh, that was, you know, running Vasa at the time to, I called my mother. I said, hey, they're going to, you know, I'm the Swedish American of the year. And I told my wife and they were all excited and happy for me. And then maybe a day or two later, I finally get on the phone with Vasa, the, the organization, and we start talking and they say, yeah, you know, we, we, we'd like you to be in Sweden for six or seven days. We're going to go to four or five towns. We're going to have dinners. We're going to do all this and that. And it'll be in like five months from now. And I'm like, well, I never know what I'm doing five months in advance. So I won't be able to do that. But what, what can we do? Right. And so at the end of the conversation, we get to the reality, which is, well, if you can't come and do that, we can't give you the award. And it was funny because I just can't, I don't know what I'm doing six, seven months in advance. It's kind of a stream of conscience and I can't make commitments like that. So I had to call my mother and my, tell my wife, hey, I'm not the Swedish American of the year. <laughs> they took it away. And I never really had it, but it was kind of a, a humorous thing. And over the years, because my life hasn't really changed, you know, and uh, I, I'm in the E Street Band, even my own between health and family, sometimes a lot of things are very last minute. And I just can't make a commitment seven months from now to be anywhere. So we finally figured it out that since Bruce is coming to play with the E Street Band in Sweden, is there a way that we can get to me and, and did get this done, and we did. And I was so grateful because it was between two shows in Gothenburg. And of course, the next step was, well, we're doing these three and a half to four hour shows. And the band, we're all just exhilarated and excited, but we're pretty beat up. And because we're all in our 60s, right? And we love it, of course, but it, you know that kind of exhilaration tires you out too. If there's any way to do it in our hotel, there's a good chance that a lot of the band will show up. If it's in some beautiful hall, 20 minutes across town, you're not gonna see anybody but me and Amy. So it all worked out and we had it in the hotel. It was very, um, I, I'm very uh, kind of uneasy with accolades even though I'm proud of making music. To me, there's just uh, being in front of an audience and singing and playing, whether it's my songs as the band leader or in a great band with Bruce or Neil Young or Ringo or any of the people I've worked with, 
it feels like a home to me. You know, it's very much like a home. And, and you know, there's this intrinsic thing of really working hard to, to share a gift that I got that's not of my own making. You know, the hours of practice, that's, that's my work. But the gift of how I hear notes, I got that from my parents' DNA and some higher power or God or spirit. So I don't really feel that's of my own making. It's just I was given this. What are you going to do with it? If I practiced twice as much, would I maybe have done more with it? Sure. But I did enough of it to have a life and a career and a job and be able to sing and play for people, which to me is very rewarding and healing for me. And it's a very natural thing because you really feel like you're giving something. To be in a setting where somebody's like giving you an award and you're just sitting there eating and visit, you know, you feel awkward. You know, you feel self-conscious. Like, well, I'm... Uh, but nevertheless, it was such a, a gorgeous, beautiful thing. And, and two, because I'm, my dad's from Sweden, to have my cousins there. And, you know, just to have my family be happy and, and proud of me and just that it's something they, they would acknowledge. Uh, you know, which it goes back to having great family, you know. And look, I, I, I said earlier, there's so many people that don't have a healthy family situation. And, you know, if I didn't have a great father and mother, and, you know, I had an awful family, I mean, I might not, not have even cared about an award like that. I mean, because it's more to me about family, uh, so much about th than the music. Of course, that plays into it. But, and my heritage, and you know, if my heritage had been a broken home or a lousy family, I don't even know if I would have been interested because I had a great family and I see it in my brothers and, you know, even my wife Amy says, look, you can see your father and mother and all your brothers and they're good fathers, they're good men, they're good people. And uh, which, you know, you want everyone to be, of course, but uh, people that have to overcome a bad family situation, it's a lot of extra work and, and trauma. And I was one of the lucky ones who never had that challenge. I had a great family. So to honor my family too, and my Swedish heritage in Sweden, with my wife, Dylan flew over, my son with his girlfriend, and having the band there, you know, and, and also being employed, and <laughs> having just done a great show and having another one coming up, just a very magical experience, very overwhelming. And I remember in the beginning, uh, you know, I, I was going to play a little accordion, which was, was fine. And, but in the beginning, they had some singers, these uh, beautiful singers singing some songs in the hallway where people were drinking. There was an echo in the room. And it was, you know, they were just standing with us while we were having cocktails. And it was such a startling sound. Because usually at events like that, and we've all been to award shows, Grammys, this, that, you know, small, big, medium dinners where they honor Bruce or the band. And, you know, you're sitting around having a drink before dinner. Usually there's not eight or 10 brilliant singers singing in, right in front of you. And then this hall with high ceilings with this kind of echo, and it was startling. It was beautiful. And, you know, even my bandmates, I could see like, wow. And it kind of set the tone for the whole day, which was just gorgeous to share it with my family. And Elsa and some of my cousins came down from quite a distance to be there. It was very emotional for me and my wife and, and my son. And, um, you know, getting all these books and awards and for the next show, of course, you know, Bruce said, hey, you ought to put them all out on the top of your amplifier so when I introduce you, they can do a shot of it. And we did that. But... Um, Near the end, it really surprised us all when the band, the little band that was playing, you know, the, the girls, singers, and a couple of instrumentation sang Shine Silently with the choir. That completely caught me off guard. And it's so strange to like, because, you know, I'm, I'm not, I've been making music professionally for 50 years, never had any hit records. So I'm not used to turning on the radio and hearing myself. I'm not used to walking in a bar and hearing myself. So all of a sudden to be in that and have somebody, these people presenting this song, um, it was very powerful and you know, it was just a very emotional, exciting day. And, um, just another room, just another town, same old crazy people hanging around, still you shine. Coming down alone, feel like.
You, babe. 